Dear colleagues, if you would like to take seats and uh, soon we'll start. Mr. Nika, welcome. Good. Dear colleagues, welcome to the ITRE committee meeting. Uh, and the first item on the agenda will be to adopt the agenda. So if there are no comments, the agenda can be adopted. I see no comments. Then to kindly announce you colleagues that uh, our meeting is web streamed, that we have interpretation in uh, all languages, except just for Maltese. And just to remind you before going to the uh, hearing, Uh, due to the fact that uh, we need to go fast with uh, electricity market design and remit, uh, just I would like to remind you that the deadline for amendments on uh, EMD will be on 23rd of May at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and remit the next day, 24th of May 2023, of course, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 17 hours. Item 3 on the agenda will be to announce you that the coordinator's decision of uh, the meeting of 28th of March have been communicated to all ITRA members by email. Then we go to the main item uh, on our uh, meeting this afternoon, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, the public hearing on the reform of the electricity market. I would like to welcome all the speakers to this public hearing and thank them for having accepted uh, our uh, invitation. I will uh, just announce, and then of course uh, we'll hear from each of our guests, that we have together with us today Mr. Konrad Purchala, Managing Director for System Management in Polskie Sieci Elektroenergetskie, which is the Polish TCO in electricity. We have also Mrs. Natalia Fabra, Professor of Economics at Universidad Carlos III, de Madrid, Carlos Tres. Uh, she is uh, remotely, I think. Yes. Uh, then we have Mr. Jörg Zachman, senior fellow at Bruegel, a very well-known think tank. Then we have Professor Jorge Vasconcelos, chairman of NEWES, New Energy Solutions. We have uh, Mr. Jaume Lofredo, senior energy policy officer and energy team leader of BEUC, the European Consumer uh, uh, Organization, Associations of Consumers, and uh, last but not least, Christian Ruby, Secretary General of Euro, Euroelectric. Just to remind you, dear colleagues, uh, and then I go directly to our guest, that on 14th of March, European Commission proposed a package of reforms to the existing electricity market design, affecting several pieces of legislation. Clearly, uh, what is aiming on this is to accelerate renewable generation and phase out of fossil gas um, in accordance with our uh, climate change agenda uh, 2050 uh, and uh, Fit for 55 in 2030, and also Repower EU, to make electricity bills less dependent on volatile fossil fuel prices, extremely important in uh, these times that uh, we experienced and maybe will experience in the near future, to better protect users from future price spikes and potential market manipulation and make the EU's industry clean and more competitive. The rapporteurs and shadows for the files have been appointed and an ambitious timetable has been set and soon will negotiate also with other committees from European Parliament in order also to uh, uh, be on time. It is our aim to process the files in a speedy manner and therefore this public hearing is an excellent opportunity to hear the views of stakeholders and experts on the matter and hold an exchange of views. We have approximately two hours for this hearing and uh, as I said, first we go to the uh, guests, to the experts, then we have a first round of rapporteurs and shadows, then uh, we'll have the answers to the first round and then we have the second round where we have... Uh, the coordinators, but also other colleagues eager to ask questions or make comments, hear the uh, opinion of the esteemed 
experts that we have today. By saying that, we go I go directly to the first intervenant, which is, uh, who is Mr. Purcala. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished members of the, of the parliament, um, my name is Kona Purhawa. I work for the Polish TSO. I'd like to speak to you about the two important pillars of the energy transition, which is megawatts, which is energy, and mega, megawatt hours energy, and megawatts, which is capacity. I would like to explain to you and discuss with you about how these two uh, products contribute to the security of supply for Ukraine customers and why European market design should duly recognize the contribution of both of these products to security of supply. So next slide. So let me, something happen with the presentation. All right, so uh, I would like to start off with the product, which is energy, megawatt hours. For these, for megawatt hours, we have renewables, which are a very good source of energy. They produce uh, clean, low-cost electricity. Uh, production of, of megawatt hours energy from renewables also reduces dependency of Europe on imported uh, fossil fuels. This is why investment in renewables dominate the generation capacity investment in Europe. In the recent years, uh, hardly any other capacity than renewable capacity was added into the system. And even more investments of renewables are planned and needed also for, for, uh, for, for, the, for the green transition of the European economy. At the same time, we all know that successful integration of renewables requires meeting a number of challenges, among which the need to expand the network, the need to expand the connections, the need to, uh, add, to add new advanced hardware to stabilize the network operation, which all has certain not to be uh, underestimated manufacturing and delivery costs, also with high capital costs. But we are all going in that direction. We are all working very hard to to uh, increase uh, the, um, the contribution uh, from renewables into megawatt hours, which is the energy supply. However, megawatt hours is not everything. Next to megawatt hours, we need sorry, something is not working with the speech. We, next to megawatt hours, we also have capacity, which is megawatt. What is the capacity? Capacity is the ability to generate electricity, to generate electrical energy where, when it is called for. Why? Because each time a customer switches on a light, light bulb or millions of customers are switching on the light bulbs at the same time, some generator needs to produce more electricity. Because electricity needs to be balanced in all moments, in all milliseconds. Generation demand must always be kept in equilibrium. Now, not all generation capacity is equal in terms, of, in terms of the ability to produce this electrical energy at will. So there is dispatchable generation, which is the conventional, traditional generation, which can be increased, generation can be increased, basically at will to adapt to the needs of the customers, which is nuclear, and it is also fossil-based, like coal, gas, uh, oil, hydro, geothermal, and all the other resources, which are dispatchable. There's also other resources which are not dispatchable, and unfortunately, one of these are renewables, which are a very good source of megawatt hours energy, but not really a good source of capacity. Now, what we need for our customers, for, uh, for the economy and for the, for the businesses, is a reliable security of supply, and this reliable security of supply requires not only megawatt hour, not only energy, but also capacity. And flexibility will obviously be also a part of the solution. To, um, uh, you can al always uh, uh, allow customers to react to prices, to, to disconnect, but you cannot disconnect the whole country or you cannot disconnect 80% of the demand. So there is limits to demand flexibility. We need flexible generation, all of it, which is available from all technologies which are available today. That's why I would like to make a strong point that capacity markets, which are market for megawatts, 
must be a part of EU policy, and the recast of electricity regulation must recognize the importance of, of capacity into security supply. Development of renewables, which we are all doing, and it works very rapidly, and we are quite successful in developing renewables, must be also paired with adequate development of megawatts from dispatchable sources. And this is not so great, because we don't see too many investments in dispatchable generation to displace, to displace the olding and, 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 and uh, uh, generation fleet which needs to re uh, retire. Capacity markets shall be technology agnostics and it shall be a structured part of the European market design. As I, as I already said, we need contribution from, to capacity from all available sources. And unfortunately, at this moment, these are to a large extent also fossil fossil-fired sources, which would produce much less energy, but their contribution to capacity, so to ensuring security of supply in all moments, even when the wind is not blowing, is extremely valuable. And I believe that this, we need to make sure that we are stopping retirements of old units, and we are building new units, dispatchable ones, because we cannot allow to leave European power system and customers vulnerable to weather, like in the old pre-industrial area. Thank so, you so much. Thank Please. you very much. Ah, thank, you. thank you so much, Mr. Porhala. The interventions, interventions are scheduled for five minutes. In order to have time for colleagues to ask questions anyway, you'll have uh, also the opportunity to have some final conclusions uh, and also to answer to the questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Porhala. I go to the next... Uh, uh, speaker uh, coming remotely to our meeting, uh, Professor Fabra. Hello, please. good afternoon. Hello, we can hear and see you well, please. Excellent. Thank you so much for having uh, me here. I want to take a step back and, and probably a broader perspective and start by asking what are the main objectives we want uh, electricity market design to deliver. First, we want electricity prices for European consumers to be competitive and stable and we want electricity market design to provide a framework that supports and pushes the energy transition forward. Has the current electricity market design delivered regarding these two objectives? I believe they have not. Over the last two years we have seen that electricity uh, markets have failed consumers because they have delivered prices that exceed the cost of generating that electricity and they have delivered extremely volatile prices whose volatility goes far beyond the volatility in the cost of electric generation. Let's keep in mind that only a fraction of total electricity is being produced in gas fire plants. The cost of nuclear renewables and hydro have uh, remained uh, stable. Clearly, these uh, highly uh, volatile and, and non-competitive prices have come at a huge societal uh, cost uh, for Europe. We have seen that they have contributed to increase inflation. Uh, they have uh, pushed the European Central Bank, among other factors, to increase interest rates. They have increased uh, energy poverty. They have reduced the disposable income of European households. And they have uh, uh, implied a lot of competitiveness of the uh, European uh, industry. Therefore, we have to do something about this. The European Commission has made a proposal on electricity market design and the question is whether this proposal will also deliver regarding these two objectives. And let me say up front that unfortunately I think this is not the case. Uh, the uh, proposal made by the Commission doesn't really bring anything new that would allow the member states to prevent the episodes of high and volatile prices that we have seen over these two days. And I'm also agnostic as to whether it would provide uh, the necessary tools uh, to push the energy transition forward. Let me go step by step. First, uh, the, the proposal of the Commission to deliver stable prices to European households is to allow member states to regulate uh, retail prices in the case of an emergency. But this is not going to solve the problem. Why? Because the problem is upstream. If we regulate retail prices, but we let generators keep on receiving uh, high electricity prices, at the end somebody's going to have to pay for the difference. And uh, who that's going to be? Probably that's going to be taxpayers. So depending on the financial ability of the member states, uh, they will have 
uh, different abilities to face uh, this increase in electricity prices. Uh, in any case, ultimately, it's going to be European citizens who are going to pay these uh, high prices. So, so why is the problem not solved? Because the problem, as I said before, the root cause of the problem lies in the over-remuneration of some of the uh, power uh, uh, plants uh, whose cost of generation are much lower than the prices uh, we have seen uh, over the last two years. So if we want to solve the problem of high and volatile electricity prices in Europe, we really have to empower member states to limit the remuneration of some of the inframarginal producers, including legacy plants, uh, when the prices that they obtain are not uh, justified, first, on the basis of their legitimate uh, expectations as investors, and second, on the basis of the generation cost. The second proposal of the uh, European Commission to allow uh, European customers to have a stable prices is to require retailers to offer uh, fixed price contracts. This is certainly going to deliver stable prices, but nothing guarantees that these prices are going to be competitive. In the best case scenario, these prices are going to reflect the expected prices in the short run markets plus a rich premium, and therefore these prices of these fixed price contracts are still going to reflect the prices in the short run market. Not to say that uh, forcing uh, retailers to offer fixed price uh, contracts contradicts the policies to promote demand flexibility because without this price signal, households won't have incentives to shift their demand from periods when there is, for instance, uh, uh, scarce renewables to when uh, renewables are abundant. What about industrial consumers? Essentially, the proposal of the European Commission uh, leaves industrial consumers uh, un unprotected. They are encouraged to enter into long-term contracts, which would certainly uh, deliver stable prices. But again, there is no guarantee that these long-term contracts is going to uh, reflect the true cost of electricity generation rather than the short-run, uh, rather than the prices in the short-run markets. I believe that the survival of the European industry, some of it is at risk, and the best way uh, to uh, protect the industry is not really through subsidies, but rather through an electricity market design that allows them to have access uh, to prices that truly reflect the cost of electricity generation. I think the European Commission is right in preserving short-run electricity markets because they are instrumental to achieve productive efficiency in the short run. And I think that the European Commission is also right in trying to promote long-term contracting, which is necessary not only to deliver a stable price for consumers, but also to support investments in low-carbon technologies. But here I have to say that I disagree on the emphasis that the European Commission has put on essentially the two main channels that we have uh, for uh, long-term contracting, which, which are uh, PPAs, the so-called PPAs, which is nothing but bilateral private uh, contracts versus auctions for contracts for differences that are backed by the regulators. The bilateral uh, contracts are subject to uh, important counterparty risk and therefore the European Commission is asking member states to ensure that there's enough guarantees uh, so that uh, these uh, bilateral contracts can be signed. I fear that uh, these guarantees will in some cases involve a state aid and I fear this is going to put large amounts of public money at risk at the same time as it might give rise to moral hazard problems. Thank you. If we, can I just to yes. conclude, if I may just one second? Uh, I think that the best way to reduce counterparty risk and promote long-term contracting to push investments in, in renewables is to foster the use of options backed by regulators, which at the same time guarantee that the lower price of these contracts are going to be passed on uh, to, the, to the final consumers. I hope that during the discussion we will have more time to go deeper into these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I go now to Mr. Zachman, senior fellow at Bruegel, and I kindly invite him to take the floor. Sorry. Yes. Um, good afternoon, um, members of parliament, uh, colleagues. Um, I, yes. Um, okay, let's start at the late slide. Hmm? Same. Can I go to the first slide? Or? Okay. Um, if you want to, uh, to discuss European electricity market design, you indeed have to start by uh, understanding what's the purpose of electricity market design. And um, then what we do here is essentially say there are three main purposes, the uh, efficient use of the existing system, making sure it's fair, and making sure we get the investments. Mm -hmm. And 
we can assess the Commission proposal accordingly. Now, uh, what does the Commission proposal say on the efficient use of the existing system? Well, it essentially keeps the, uh, the marginal pricing system, and uh, we believe that this is a good thing. But we think it falls short on a, on a number of uh, elements. Uh, the first one is it does not provide the right locational signals. So what is locational signals? If demand in France for electricity is high, not necessarily all the power plants in South Germany that can help to fulfill this demand are running in the current system. The second element that, is, uh, uh, that could be strengthened is that we need a good design of the so-called contracts for difference. Here, for example, it might be that very simple contracts for difference might discourage solar panels that look towards the west and produce electricity in the evening when we need the electricity more. So not only focusing on the amount of electricity, but also when this electricity is being produced. The third element is encouraging flexibility. So we really need to make sure that, uh, that people charge their electric vehicles and in the future even more so uh, when power is plentiful. Another element is that we uh, risk to uh, overly fragment the amount of instruments in the system. So when we look into the commission instruments, it's five, six, seven national instruments. If you get all of them, it's getting extremely complicated what the cash flows are. And uh, I'll talk later about that more. And then we need to make sure that we enable the use of resources in neighboring countries. So if there is uh, uh, batteries in Germany, then uh, they should also be used by the, by the uh, Danish or the, uh, the Polish market. The second thing, and pro uh, the most important one, now it complete, completely disappeared, uh, is a fair distribution of, uh, of, cost, and, uh, uh, of cost and benefits. Now, the Commission here proposes uh, a number of, uh, of things, and as Natalia uh, indicated, it's relatively hard to assess whether they are going to deliver, and in my view, they uh, include a number of, uh, of risks for market fragmentation. In, in my view, again, uh, what, uh, what should be added is to make sure that the, uh, that the system costs are attributed to consumers in a fair way. So we currently focus a lot on electricity wholesale, but we also have to look about network cost and other elements. And if we, for example, think about the CFDs, uh, it might end up in a, a world where taxpayers uh, are going to pay for electricity users. So we have to make sure that here the, uh, the, uh, the distribution is done in an uh, in a equitable way. The last point, and potentially the most important one, is ensuring investment, because investment is what is driving down cost eventually, what is helping us to ensure that we are not getting in a situation as the, as the current one. And the Commission puts a lot of emphasis on investment. They are adding an, a new chapter only on the investment instruments, so chapter three with article 19, and it sets out at least five different investment instruments here, contracts for difference, uh, power purchase agreements, capacity remuneration mechanisms, flexibility mechanism, and, uh, and then you have this, uh, this peak shaving element. Um, so there is a lot of emphasis on that, but my worry is that the Commission essentially hands it over to the member states. Member states are going to decide which of the instruments they are going to design how, and there's relative, to me it's unclear how the coordination between member states of these investments are going to look like. So we might end up in a world where Member states are going to, uh, to, uh, to overbuild certain things because uh, in, in, uh, in other member states we have the similar instruments. We might have instrument, uh, elements or, um, where we create artifacts because we have so many overlapping instruments that we get um, like five instruments helping, uh, helping batteries and we get a lot of batteries in the system. Maybe it would have been more efficient to build some, uh, some gas peakers and, uh, and, and wind turbine instead. But because we have these fragmented instruments in each and every member state and little coordination between the member states, we might run into, uh, into a very expensive system and a very complicated one. Now, uh, a very, very final point, if I get these slides to move to the next slide, yes, on, uh, on governance. 
The discussion has shown to, to probably everybody involved how complex European electricity markets have become by now, how complex they are going to be and how important they are going to be in the future. It's going to be the oil of the 21st century. Electricity is going to be the dominant vector. It's driving our competitiveness and, uh, and social energy costs. So we need to find ways to probably deal with that. So we need some European public body that collects the information on that, that makes them available to policymakers to decide because a situation where the Commission cannot even come up with an impact assessment because it's too complicated to them is not really going to, uh, to work in the future if we want to get science-based and objective policymaking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I go now to Mr. Vas Vasconcelos, the chairman of NUES. Mr. Vasconcelos, please. Honorable members of the parliament, dear colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure being here uh, and trying to answer your questions on this issue. I would like to start by recalling that the European Parliament has always played a crucial role in shaping the internal energy market, starting from the very beginning in 1991. The legal basis of the internal energy market was, in fact, imposed by the Parliament. It was not the first choice of the European Commission. Now we are in a situation where we see derogations everywhere. The legal basis, the legal framework of our internal energy market is not very coherent. So I think it's time to go back to the basics, to the establishment of a clear, coherent legal framework. Energy law has a role to play here, not only engineering, not only economics. Uh, my message is that uh, I believe that the European Parliament should support and should enhance the Commission's proposal, and I will try to explain why. Why to support this proposal? Uh, first, because electricity market reform is overdue. Uh, yesterday I was uh, going through my archives at home, and I found a four-page paper that I presented here at the European Parliament back in 2008. Uh, there was a public hearing on the third energy package. And I was reading this document, that, uh, this paper that I wrote 15 years ago, and I thought, oh, 15 years lost. And why? Because there was too much reliance on economic theory and too little trust on innovation, technical <coughs> and social innovation. I think this is a lesson that we should learn. We, don't, we can't afford losing 15 more years. And we can't do that because otherwise we will not meet, meet our targets for 2030. Electricity today represents 23% of total final energy consumption in energy demand in the European Union. If we want to decarbonize by 2030 according to the European and national commitments, this means that we should have about 66% or something like that of electricity in total final energy demand. So it's inconceivable that the existing market model, which was designed 25 years ago for 20% of total final energy, would be fit for 66% of total final energy. We need to take into account the new sectors, mobility, heating and cooling, and so on and so forth. All those sectors that we're going to decarbonize through electrification with the existing technical solutions. We don't need to wait to do that. So this is, these are the two main reasons why I believe that the Commission proposals should be supported in the first place, but they should also be enhanced. And I give here three suggestions. The first is to open more doors. The, the present model is too rigid. It's, it's too centralized, too centralistic, too monopolistic. We have to open doors to re relax some of those unnecessary restrictions. The Commission does that in their proposal. They have now long-term contracts, not only short-term uh, transactions. They have other types of transactions like sharing. And all those proposals are very positive. But there are more doors that can be opened. And the Parliament can be very 
helpful in helping the Commission opening even more doors, removing those unnecessary restrictions that we have today that are preventing the massive deployment of new technical solutions, not only more PV and wind, but storage and other kinds of mechanisms. Second message is to support, actively support, <coughs> local energy platforms and also EU system operation coordination. Of course, this is there, you can find language there, but this is not enough. It's not just enough enabling those things to happen. We need to strongly support, proactively support these developments because they are crucial. And mandate full energy digitalization. We are nowadays all very much concerned about IRA and the impact of the American policy upon our competitiveness. And we are discussing more subsidies to, um, to use in the energy sector. My suggestion would be not to spend taxpayers' money, but just to define European standards for energy digitalization, as Europe has done in the past in other sectors very successfully. And if Europe establishes the necessary energy digitalization standards, this will um, assure our leadership for the next decade without taxpayers' money. So the three principles that I always suggest for the transition, and this includes the market reform, are subsidiarity, which means some things must be done at the European level. Please, let's introduce an European independent system operator. Otherwise, we cannot operate our system in a reliable and efficient way. This is known for many years. Now let's do that step. But on the other hand, many things can only be done at the local level, not at the national level, not at the European level. This has to do with energy system integration, right? So 70% of the population lives in urban areas. Buildings represent 42%. Road uh, transport, 27% of final energy demand. That's urban areas. That's why municipalities and energy communities have a crucial role to play in this transition, in this market reform. They, our municipalities, our communities should have the capacity, financial and technical capacity, to drive the, uh, digital, the decarbonization. And finally, again, digitalization and innovation at large. And uh, just to, to leave you with one picture to visualize how I see the transition and how I see the difference between the existing current model on the left-hand side and the new European uh, model on the right-hand side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I go now to Beuk, to the consumers, and I invite Mr. Lofredo to take the floor. Um, President Bushoi, honorable members, first, uh, I would like to thank you for inviting us to uh, for inviting us to express our views on this, uh, on this proposal. Uh, a proposal that, to our perspective, it's, uh, uh, it's extremely important because what we observed over the past couple of years is that uh, uh, what consumers need is better protections and better rights in electricity markets. Um, I could talk about uh, this issue for hours, but uh, I propose that, uh, you know, for, uh, for the moment, I will focus on uh, three main elements that are important for us three elements that are more related to, uh, to retail markets and to reform retail markets, and uh, this is what I plan to, to focus today, retail markets. Uh, first point is about fixed price contracts. Uh, as we know, in several countries, fixed price contracts disappeared when prices started to increase. We have evidence, for example, from, from Italy or from Belgium, where consumers were looking for a fixed price contract because they wanted to have a guarantee over the price that they were going to pay for energy until the end of the contract. Um, these contracts disappeared, these limited consumers' choice, and to our perspective, it is positive that uh, uh, the Commission is, uh, uh, is proposing to, uh, well, to have a requirement for larger suppliers to make available both fixed price contracts for those consumers who don't want to take the risk and dynamic price contracts for those consumers who uh, are willing to be exposed to wholesale prices. However, to our perspective, fixed prices should be fixed. What we observed on the markets, on several markets, like uh, Italy, like Netherlands, uh, like Denmark, is that uh, millions of consumers who had a fixed price contract saw that the price that they were paying for energy uh, actually increased before the end of the contract. Uh, there is uh, uh, an example in Italy where the Italian Competition Authority started an investigation for unilateral increases of 8 million retail contracts. 
Um, and this, uh, to our perspective, is not positive because when consumers choose a fixed price contract, they decide to pay more to be protected against the price fluctuations in wholesale markets. If consumers do not receive this protection, then they are not receiving the service that they contracted. So to our perspective, it's important to ban this practice. Uh, what the new proposal of, uh, of the Commission uh, has is uh, a ban on these, uh, uh, on these practices. However, the wording is not clear enough, and to our perspective, it should be uh, better clarified to avoid any uh, legal controversies afterwards. My second point is about these connections. Um, to our perspective, it's positive that the Commission is inserting a new article protecting consumers against these connections. And not to say that, uh, uh, well, vulnerable consumers against these connections. We don't want to say that vulnerable consumers should not pay for energy, not at all. What we want to see is more focus on the supplier side to uh, allow consumers to help consumers to pay for the energy and to help consumers to manage their energy consumption. For example, uh, offering them uh, energy, efficiency, energy efficiency product. Um, to our perspective, uh, what the Commission is proposing is positive. <coughs> However, uh, the Commission foresees protection for vulnerable consumers that we would like to see extended also to energy poor consumers. We now have a definition of energy poverty in the Energy Efficiency Directive, and this definition covers precisely those consumers who would need some support. And to our perspective, it would be a missed opportunity if uh, well, the, the European Union decides not to protect uh, the energy poor. Uh, my, last, my last point is about uh, allowing consumers to uh, benefit from uh, renewable energy and potentially make savings. The European Commission is uh, proposing to have uh, a new article on energy, uh, energy sharing which uh, uh, promotes uh, uh, practices uh, and business models where myself as a consumer with a solar panel, I can share electricity with my peers. And to our perspective, this is positive because uh, uh, this can potentially allow uh, those consumers who produce uh, electricity to, uh, to have a better return on investment in their investment in a solar panel, but also those consumers who are purchasing electricity from other consumers to make savings in their bills. However, uh, the devil is in the detail as always. Uh, the proposal foresees for small-scale energy sharing a blanket exemption from any consumer rights. And to our perspective, this is problematic because although it is uh, reasonable uh, to expect that uh, consumers who are selling electricity to other consumers should not be uh, basically liable for all the, the requirements that uh, suppliers need to comply with, yet some basic consumer rights should apply. And to, uh, to illustrate very simply, if I'm purchasing electricity from, from Christian sitting here, I should, at the very least, receive from Christian a bill explaining me how much electricity I purchased from him and explaining me, explain me how much uh, I'm paying and, uh, based on the electricity that uh, I'm purchasing. So, uh, to sum up, and here I conclude, uh, we think that there are three uh, major improvements that uh, uh, would bring uh, major benefits for, for consumers. First one is banning unilateral contract, contract changes of fixed price contracts. Second, protecting uh, energy poor consumers from disconnections. And third, ensuring the consumers that engage in energy sharing have uh, uh, some consumer rights, some basic consumer rights. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, thank you so much. And now I go to Mr. Cristiano Rubi, representing Euroelectric, and I invite him to take the floor. Thank you very much, honored member of parliament and, and gentlemen. If you get electricity from me, you get it from the market. So <laughs> it's just for reference. Um, we, we are facing a, a very serious situation as Europe. Um, we need to deliver on, on the 2030 targets that have uh, been set. Um, that requires a build out of some 700 gigawatts of uh, electric capacity over the remainder of this decade, um, translating into 80 billion euros of annual investments. 80 billion. That means that the investors need to trust in the market. Uh, they need to trust that um, the framework they're given is also one that, that allows them to, to get a return on their investments. At the same time, uh, the crisis has shown us that we need to take care of uh, customers and ensure that they uh, have a choice at the very least to be shielded from the most extreme volatility provided by the uh, short-term market. 
Uh, in that light, uh, the European electricity industry uh, feels that it is a fairly balanced proposal. It is an honest attempt to, uh, to uh, uh, propose some uh, targeted revisions that the Commission has come forward with. And indeed, we feel that uh, there are uh, several elements that, um, that deserve uh, to be preserved in this proposal. Um, the fundamentals of, of the market model uh, remain preserved. We feel that is very important. At the same time, it is being uh, complemented with long-term uh, investment signals, which we have been asking for uh, for a long time. So that's positive. We also find it positive that it uh, primarily takes a market-based approach in the sense that it uh, favors PPAs and seeks to uh, remove barriers uh, for the rollout and, and massification of PPAs. Uh, the use of complementary state interventions should remain, uh, should remain complementary uh, as an add-on to the market and, and therefore any use of CFDs should also remain uh, uh, voluntary. Looking at what, uh, let's say, can be improved in the uh, proposal or needs adjustment in the proposal, we feel that on the one hand it's important to um, to provide customers with uh, an additional amount of uh, choice in this situation. But if uh, customers uh, have a, a, an access to long-term contracts, for instance, um, the change to a contractual arrangement should also uh, acknowledge uh, the transaction cost that, that it involves. So, so that's an important point. And, um, and in general, striking the balance between customer protection and supply regulation uh, that preserves competition is, is something that we assign quite a bit of importance to. Another thing uh, that, that deserves uh, some adjustment is uh, the approach to flexibility. Um, we see that the proposal um, ex uh, basically goes in the direction of, of, of blurring the boundary between monopoly and market a bit. Uh, the so-called peak shaving product uh, basically involves um, uh, the TSOs as, as, as a party um, to, to uh, flexibility procurement, which, which uh, confuses things and, and essentially uh, risks putting, um, putting a... Um, uh, draining the, 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 the uh, flexibility markets. So, uh, so we see some need for that. Another adjustment would be uh, further detailing of uh, the reference to so-called anticipatory investments um, for grids. We know where the energy transition is going. It is going uh, electric, and that means we will have millions of electric cars, millions of heat pumps, which means that uh, grid operators today should be able to... Um, to make the necessary investments. <clears throat> so what further to assess? Because there are a few things that, that we're not uh, completely um, uh, in love with, to, to say the least. Um, one of the things that we worry a bit about, um, to be frank, is, uh, is the so-called uh, virtual hubs for trading that seek uh, a honorable purpose, which is to increase uh, liquidity. However, we're concerned that um, essentially we're dealing with a proposal that has not enjoyed any sort of assessment and, and therefore risks doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do. So, so we suggest to further assess this before it is implemented uh, all across Europe and to make sure that we know what we're doing because, as I said in the beginning, the stakes are high. If we get this wrong, we don't get the investments to reach the targets and tackle the climate crisis. So let's be careful. Let's make sure that we know what we do. Um, then we, we also think that, that uh, we need to be careful when looking at um, the emergency framework um, and, and we, we want to avoid that we uh, preempt ongoing work streams such as the bidding zone review and network codes for demand side response, all of which could, um, could, could basically uh, do more damage uh, than, than good. Last but not least, when addressing the uh, review of the remit uh, uh, we need to be sure that we do the right thing for the sector and remember what sector we're dealing with. The electricity sector sells electricity. It is not a financial sector. If we start regulating electricity in the same way and with the same um, heavy amount of regulation that, that pertains to banks, that will ultimately increase the cost for the consumer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. After this uh, very interesting... Uh presentations and also 
many questions has been uh, raised, or not only just suggestions for uh, colleagues uh, that uh, will uh, contribute to the improvement of the good proposal from European Commission. We go to the first round, the round of rapporteurs and shadows. And on behalf of EPP, I invite uh, Mrs. Carvalho. She's a rapporteur on REMIT and shadow on EMD. Uh, three minutes. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for very interest, um, some different point of views, but all very interesting uh, presentations. I will start with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Burchala. Uh, I like it very much, the distinction of megawatt and megawatt hour energy and capacity, being an engineer exactly on the energy side. I like the way you have structured. Uh, your your uh, short presentation and what I want to you, you have told us that we really need to to have a capacity market not only a electricity market and my question is uh, we have uh, already uh, capacity markets uh, in the existing package of the electricity market why what we have uh, is not sufficient. If what is the main reasons to reopen the the, the clause on capacity markets? Um, my my second uh, question to the, our second speaker from Bruegel, uh, Mr. Zachman. Uh, you have uh, uh, and very well uh, uh, enumerated that we should have good CFD design. So if we could also elaborate on the principles that you defend for um, the, the good CFD design and which level of uh, European common rules we should have for the CFDs. Uh, Professor Faber, um, uh, it was a pity that in the last uh, sentence um, you didn't have more time to elaborate, so I will ask you, you have uh, criticized the option for a long-term contract of the Commission based first in PPAs and, uh, as, and as a second uh, option, uh, the CFDs. Uh, you have uh, told us that uh, you prefer alternative options for long-term uh, long contracts, so if we could elaborate uh, with a bit more time uh, what you have said in your last uh, sentence of your presentation. Uh, to George Vasconcelos, uh, I, I, you know that I, I like very much your presentation. Um, it's very interesting, the, the concept that you uh, defend based on the digitalization and decentralization. And my question is, uh, being very pragmatic as I am, how feasible uh, in our fast-track procedure of regulation to finalize in few months uh, this, uh, uh, this task that we have in our hands, uh, that we can include or at least to leave uh, door open, as you said, uh, for this model to be able to develop uh, before we change the... <laughs> The, the legislation again because it, it, we hope that it lasts for some time that is stable so what can we do in a concrete terms that is it feasible that we leave doors open to uh, the development of, of such a, a model and uh, uh, to build to Mr. Uh, Lofredo I, I would like to, to ask uh, you have uh, give us an example how the consumers can benefit from the renewables and my question is uh, this is one of the main points we should make sure that the consumers being individual or the industry uh, will benefit from the, the, the renewables and the low price of the renewables so how do you see uh, other options for uh, this uh, to, to happen and um, okay. uh, to uh, <clears throat> last uh, Mr. Ruby, just finish my last question. To Mr. Ruby, I will ask about Remit, uh, not you have, what you have stated, but how do you see the possibility to have more uh, powers at the uh, European level 
uh, in the in the scope of the remit. How, what is your opinion? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Carvalho. SND is represented by two colleagues, but first I go to Mr. Gonzalez Casares, the rapporteur of Electricity Market Design. Three minutes. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to all of the speakers for coming here today to give us these very useful explanations and to help us firm up our position. Now, this clearly goes beyond just the electrical sector. We have seen how these prices have had an impact on our economy, have contributed to inflation. Now, we don't have time to really get into all the fundamental details here, but it's clear that this reform is here because we have had problems with pricing. So we've had to rethink certain things that we have not been doing well, some things we have been doing well. But there are clearly concerns amongst the citizens. There has been uh, economic uh, damages and problems with this transition. So I think our priorities are to increase price stability over the long term. And going along the lines of what the Commission proposes to look at storage so there's more flexibility with supply and demand to strengthen consumer protection as well, especially when prices are particularly high and when we have crisis situations as we have experienced. And also to look at the rights of consumers when it comes to energy, but without these uh, free riders that could be damaged by the system. Now, I have a lot of questions, but I will try to focus on the most important points. I will start with Mr. Puchella. Now, you talked about us not being able to trust in a modern economy with just uh, renewables for the flexibility of demand because there's issues of storage as well. And I wonder if that was fixed, if it could be more reliable. You talked about capacity mechanisms as well. So my question is is how with this uh, improvements in terms of capacity, um, how could we move forward with decarbonisation when we're talking about better storage with uh, or capacity with fossil fuels? With uh, Natalia Fabra, now I know that you are concerned about uh, something which is very important, which is our industrial consumers. You say that the Commission has left them without any tools. I wonder what specific measures you could propose for us. For Mr. Zachman from Bruegel, from my point of view, I think we could have had more explanations on emergency measures. Uh, do you think they're necessary in these cases with high prices? You talked about a European public body as well, and perhaps you could give us a bit more information with regards to this particular proposal. This seems to perhaps be a preliminary step to a greater reform, but perhaps you could tell us more. To Mr Vasconcelos, you talked about local and subsidiaries and how to promote renewables. I wonder how this case with the uh, renewables, uh, these uh, peaks that are being produced in uh, certain markets in certain countries at certain times, how we can do to ensure that these market signals are not going to affect uh, renewables? How can we protect investments in renewables? Because I think local is important, but we have to look at the global picture as well to Mr. Lofredo from Boog, you talked about vulnerable consumers being disconnected. And I think probably my group is the uh, one that best understands the importance of this types of protection. I think uh, it's very important uh, that uh, consumers are uh, protected. I think do you think this is necessary and how exactly can we uh, focus this uh, for these um, uh, contracts for difference? And then finally to Mr uh, Christian Ruby from Euroelectric. I think we're lacking these uh, capacity mechanisms in the Commission's proposal from what I have seen so you talk about these well-designed uh, capacity mechanisms, but perhaps you could elaborate exactly what that means to be well-designed. 
Now, we've had a lot of talk about this capacity and improvements in capacity, but if we go in that direction, it would be good to know exactly how to uh, tackle this. I think there are concerns with regards to that. Thank you. And is Mrs. Kumpulana three, two minutes. Remotely. Please, Mia Petra. Just press the speak button. Thank you, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. I will be short. Uh, I also think that it was a good hearing and a good comments that we see that we have to do this right. Uh, it has been long working uh, mar markets that we have had, and in some countries it has developed different than in one. So it's also very important to see the cause why market prices were so hazard for the consumers last winter not the break existing system where it functions, but then avoid this kind of uh, market uh, possibilities that are uncertain for the consumers. First question to those who want to answer, should there be differentiation of the household consumers and industrial? Uh, then for the, the first speaker, Puchala, if you have an example of the country or market that there is a capacity lack because this resembles very much the discussion in the early stage of the renewables that we were afraid to add it because of flexibility but then we have seen results that it has been added a lot for the different countries and i have not seen yet the example of that capacity market has not evolved at the same time and also flexibility has been helpful there uh, then on the uh, consumers i very much uh, uh, applause the the seeing that uh, part and, and also that all the speakers were favoring more or less the market-based solutions that we can uh, not add taxpayers' money as an automatic uh, way because we do not have that too much. For the very concrete on the remit that I'm uh, shadowing, uh, my question is that uh, we have the European electricity markets, European gas markets, but still the supervision is much on the national level. So how much would you uh, look this uh, as the financial markets, we did it too late. First we liberated uh, capital and then only later we uh, put the supervision on. If you want to refer that uh, other and national, uh, how do you see uh, this relation? Thank you. Thank you so much. On behalf of Renew, I start first with uh, Mr. Peterson, Vice Chair of the Committee, also Shadow of PMD. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks so much for all these uh, great uh, interventions. Uh, I think the diversity in, 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 in the approaches clearly demonstrates uh, what, what kind of, of task uh, we're on. I had the privilege of negotiating the market design last time around in 2019. It took us three years. Now we're going to do it in, in three months or so. Uh, so it just... I think exemplifies how difficult this is. Uh, this will be. Now, let me just touch briefly upon some of the issues that uh, we will bear in mind from Renew side in the upcoming negotiations. Clearly, the issue of investments and ensuring stability and predictability for investors out there is is paramount. And and I think the first question to uh, to 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 the panel is basically how to ensure this. Uh, I know that that George has some interesting thoughts also on the need for interim measures, given that. Uh, now we will be negotiating for I don't know how long time, but what happens in the meantime? And we see very worrying signals out there that the market is at a standstill. So all the time that we spend on negotiating this very important dossier and files, are, 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 uh, we somehow have to take into account that we will need some sort of gap-filling exercise in order to accomplish our 2030 targets. Uh, so that would be a question for, for the panel at large and not least for, for George to, uh, to elaborate on. Uh, secondly, uh, from Renew side, we're, we're going to emphasize some of the basic principles in ensuring that markets will still uh, have to work, will still work. Uh, I have a question on, on the issue of, of the CFDs and, and bearing in mind that Devil will be in the detail in, in, in this. Uh, but are we really to go for mandatory CFDs? Uh, shouldn't there be room for other ways of, of doing these things than only CFDs? Uh, why should we rule out beforehand that there might be innovation and, and, and new opportunities, possibilities out there? So, so remarks on, on the issue of mandatory CFDs would also be, uh, be welcoming. Thirdly, how do we ensure that we still have uh, what will be uh, the remaining part of an entailment market here? Because if we open up for member states applying uh, all the various kinds of CFDs and PPAs and what have you, how do we ensure that we still have an internal market at the end of the day? 
Please, I, I'd be curious for these uh, comments. Uh, and then finally, uh, something uh, as boring as implementation. Uh, I know no politician is going to get re-elected on implementation. That is so boring. But please bear in mind, we, we have already adopted uh, some, some very, say, uh, fundamental reform of this market that we still have to implement. So uh, let's keep that in mind also in the upcoming negotiation. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Mr. Peterson. Uh, the shadow for remit on the, of the Renew Group is Mrs. Gamon, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to thank the panel for the very interesting presentations. Um, and unfortunately, there, there wasn't a lot on the, on the remit reform. And I would maybe ask again or, or ask for a first time uh, with the proposal coming from the Commission that would add a lot of new ways uh, to of exchange of cooperation between regulators, more data exchange, more powers for ACE, whether or not you have any comments on that, how you would evaluate this, and maybe also whether or not anybody shares the concerns of, of Mr. Ruby on, on this topic. After all, there is a lot in there in terms of investigative power for ACER um, to investigate cross-border issues where regulators have said that there might be a regulatory gap and that there have been examples where this could have been useful in the past. And obviously this has the goal in the end to reduce prices for consumers as well. If uh, the fear is that prices would be higher, I think um, that uh, this proposal aims at exactly the opposite. But if other, uh, others agree with Mr. Ruby's um, criticism, then I would, I would love to hear it. And another thing that has been mentioned a lot on the EMD is the importance of flexibility. There have been a lot more critical voices, I guess, than I would have expected. Um, something that I would also like to thank uh, the colleague Gonzalez Casales for is, is mentioning storage and the importance of it and what this proposal could do to um, add to this. We now have in this proposal um, indicative national targets and also last week in the plenary in the debate on storage, um, uh, there has been has been floated the idea of an EU-wide target and whether or not this could change anything, especially in regards to high-capacity projects that still have the, the hindrance of really, really long permitting processes. So I, I would ask whether or not you would think that an EU-wide target could maybe be an incentive for member states to prioritize these projects differently when it comes to permitting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I go now to the Greens, to colleagues uh, being uh, uh, remotely, and I start with Mr. Bloss, the shadow for uh, electricity market design. Thank you. Ah, you are here. Yes. In my notes. Uh... Thank you. Um, yes. No, thanks. Um, I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. Uh, well, well, first of all, I think it's really important to, um, I mean, to to see that we are now doing electricity market reform um, because we had very high prices, but the high prices were not caused by the electricity market as such, but they were caused by the dependence on, uh, on Russian gas, um, on fossil fuels, and uh, for instance also uh, by, in Germany, um, with recent studies published, by the nuclear power fleet of France that just was not working because well, some of it just didn't work and the others were not working because there was not too much water, so much water in the, in the rivers to cool them down. So that, that brought electricity prices up. So now let's, I mean, still it's really good to make electricity market reform to bring prices down, but what brings prices down are really renewable energies. You know, they have a marginal cost of going to zero and integration of the system. Um, and I think this is uh, what this reform would need to go to. And so maybe, well, a couple of questions um, on the first speaker. Um, well, if I understood you correct, there is this uh, idea of opening up capacity markets, but there is no impact assessment. And working on capacity markets, is that not a little bit like, you know, then, you know, doing a heart surgery, but, but being a little bit blind? Um, second, um, um, on, on the grids, I really agree that, that um, on the grids connection that this is something important to um, to integrate. So the question is, uh, how can we, what can be done, and also how can you know, sector coupling approaches uh, being taken more into account? And in not only speaking of electricity, but we need to speak also of, 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 um, of heat, of, of hydrogen, of flexibility, um, um, all of these things. And um, to to the second. Um, 
um, person, um, um, Professor Fabra. Mm. Maybe you could explain a little bit uh, more on, on the forward market and how to make them work, how to, how to uh, design a product that, has, that puts liquidity into the forward markets. Um, and yeah, no, <laughs> later questions come later. And to, to Mr. Sachmann, um, I really, I thought it's very interesting to, um, well, to, to see this, uh, this, this question of integration. So what can be done to integrate the, the, the grids more and have more of a coordination so that we do not build a lot of, well, similar capacities in different kinds of countries that in the end will not help us. Thank you so much. I, I think it's three minutes, isn't it? No, two minutes and two minutes, Mr. Dalunde, but please. Okay. Last question. Um, um, the, the other question would be just for, for, from the consumer perspective, do you think um, that this is already enough or what else can be done, especially with regards to the um, disconnection bands? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dalunde, uh, the shadow of the Greens for Remit remotely. You should open uh, Mr. Dalunde. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks to the experts for their excellent interventions and for taking the time to discuss these files with us today. We need to ensure that energy prices are fair and not distorted by market manipulation and ensure that no profits can be drawn from market abuse. We need to increase transparency and ensure that suspicions of insider trading and market manipulations are quickly investigated and perpetrators are properly properly penalized. The European Court of Auditors Special Report of uh, 2023 concludes that there's a real risk of market manipulation. Only 8% of cross-border abuses are end with penalties and penalties are also systematically insufficient. This is why I as Green Shadow see it, see it as crucial to increase ACER's mandate within Remit to conduct the investigations and enforce rules against market abusers. So I would therefore like to ask the ex experts, and particularly Professor Vasconcelos, do you support the view that ACER should be given a stronger mandate to investigate market users, but also a mandate to enforce compliance? Second, ACER is essential to tackle market abuse, especially cross-border, but they are also severely underfunded. How crucial do you think it is that the Council changes its long-standing position and the EU finally agrees to substantially increase the resources of ACER? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, last but not least, on behalf of the left, Mrs. Marina Mejur. S'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci pour ces interventions. Thank you, Chairman, and th thank you for the contributions. As you will have noticed, there is a huge difference between what the President of the Commission stated when she talked about her, her desire for a wide-ranging reform of the electricity market and what we have before us today, a proposal which doesn't question the actual foundations of that market. So you'll allow me to express a particular position on saying that as far as I'm concerned, the management of the generation and provision of electric power should be under public auspices. There are physical constraints on the grid, after all, and it seems to me that the governments are best placed to overcome those constraints. So the first concern, given that we have experts here with us, is this. Do they think we should perhaps revisit the supply side and the generation of electricity by the public sector? Then coming back to the Commission's proposal, two questions. First of all, on BPAs. Now, that's perhaps something more for Ms. Fabra. You can see that this has created an imbalance amongst economic players, those who are able to plan their purchases and negotiate them with the producers, as opposed to the, the, the small uh, SMEs and others who won't have the financial means to do so. Above and beyond the fact that this proposal marks... Uh, a breakaway from equality in the electricity market, how can we uh, tackle the fact that the PPA doesn't cover short-term changes in electricity market prices? Shouldn't prices of consumers perhaps be indexed uh, proportionate to production prices? And, and 
turning towards um, Mr. Pushala, looking at the managers of the sector, the Commission is planning to give them some time, allowing the markets to to work up to 30 minutes before the, the time the electricity is generated, as, as opposed to an hour up until now. Now, the regulators are very concerned about this because this may throw the balance of, of the, the sector out of kilter and, and favour um, carbon fuels to make up the gap. What's your opinion, please? Now we go to our guests uh, and the head of Secretariat. Just kindly remind me that we have 18 minutes scheduled. Of course, we still have time, uh, but we have also a second round with a lot of colleagues on the list and one catch the eye interventions uh, until now. Maybe three minutes each, but well, if someone is more uh, uh, loaded with questions than others, will be flexible. And we go with the same, uh, we go with the same uh, uh, order and I kindly invite Mr. Purhala to start first. Uh, thank you very much. So I'll uh, start with the first question regarding the need to open CRMs. Uh, and there are basically two needs. The uh, first one is that uh, the proposal from the Commission introduces a rather complex and lengthy process for having a, a CRM approves, approved, uh, while uh, basically this process comes down to the fact that CRM are, are only acceptable in the, as a last resort solution where everything else fails. I believe that uh, CRM shall be a standard part of the market design in the two commodity market for which we trade with energy and also with the capacity. And the capacity is a product for which resources get remunerated and they take obligation. It's not a subsidy, it's an obligation to deliver. And if you don't deliver, you pay a high, high penalty. That's the typical capacity market. So it shall be a standard part of a market design to complement the energy market. Now, uh, the other need to open a CRM is that the capacity market, as, uh, that say CRMs are, as we have them today, as defined in the electricity regulation, there are restrictions for some technologies. And these restrictions are already materializing and they are basically banning some technologies from participation in the capacity market from 2025, the, 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 the ones with, uh, with emissions. Now, you might think, very good, let's ban all the emitting resources. Uh, but if you do so, then you do not have a backup in case uh, renewable generation is not the living energy. And it will happen. We don't have the technology yet, and we will not have it in the next three years to be able to store all the excess of electricity produced from renewables and use it in the moments of, of of lower uh, winds or lower solar, solar periods. So you, we're going to need these backup plants, and if we don't remunerate them for the, for the service they are providing, we, they, they will decommission, and then we're going to be ending up with, with energy crisis like we had last year, basically every couple of days, depending on the weather. And I don't think we shall allow our economy to, depend, to be dependent on the weather. Um, as I said, these resources will most likely provide capacity. We will run actually quite low in a, in a number of hours if we expand the renewables, and we will expand the renewables in Europe, meaning that the carbon footprint will anyway go down and it will be useful for, for the society. Now, the examples of, of, of countries where, where uh, the capacity market uh, has not helped to develop, um, I I would argue that the capacity market, generally speaking, helps to develop and is, is been proven uh, efficient to develop new capacity. Now, I think one example of my country where there are some difficulties is that after 2025, we are struggling to buy any new capacity because the investors do not want to build it because of the regulatory risk. So the stability of the investment framework to meet the, the, this huge challenge of, 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 of trillions of dollars, of euros to be spent to, in, in, to expand generation and networks, um, we need some stability in, in, in this framework. And, and uh, with the current restrictions, uh, investors are not proposing any new capacity and the old capacity is not allowed to participate. And we are not able to ensure that we buy sufficient capacity. 
Uh, I, I'm, I'm limited in time, so I stick to my ten thank minutes. You, uh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Mrs. Fabra, please. Okay, I guess you can see me now. Thank yes. you so much for giving us the chance to elaborate a bit on the issues that uh, we couldn't uh, develop before. Uh, to be clear, I'm very supportive of auctions for contract for differences, and I don't believe that uh, power purchasing agreements are going to provide a full solution or a satisfactory one. And, and, and the reasons for these were already uh, mentioned by the French uh, Member of Parliament. Indeed, when we are dealing with uh, bilateral contracting between two parties, there's no guarantee that the resulting price are going to be competitive. There's a strong asymmetries in the bargaining positions of the two parties. Not all the buyers can afford entering into a bilateral contract, which is extremely complex and, uh, and probably um, um, very expensive for them if they don't provide sufficient uh, guarantees for this uh, counterparty risk. Contracts, um, bilateral contracts or markets for PPAs have demonstrated to be extremely opaque, uh, not to lead uh, to competitive outcomes. And in any case, when we are dealing with PPAs uh, with energy retailers that have to pass on the price of those contracts to the final consumers, there's no guarantee that those prices are going to be passed on to the end consumers, which is, at the end of the day, what we are looking for. We are seeing that uh, these markets are failing. There is not enough liquidity of these contracts, and the contracts on offer are not of sufficient long duration, and there is a problem of uh, counterparty risk here. So, as I said before, if we want to reduce the counterparty risk, rather than providing uh, estate guarantees to these uh, private contracts that do not guarantee that the lower price are passed on to the end users, it is better to have the regulator, the system, uh, as the counterparty of these contracts. And how can we achieve this? We can achieve this through auctions for contract for differences, such that, uh, first, they are going to foster more competitive outcomes. We know from a theory point of view that auctions are a more competitive mechanism than bilateral uh, negotiations. Second, making sure that these lower auction prices are going to be passed on uh, to, the, to the final consumers. And third, what is very important, because there's a calendar of auctions, there's some predictability for the industry, for the whole value chain, to know exactly that there's going to be certainty over the path of deployment of these renewables and therefore also foster the development of the uh, European manufacturing industry to provide uh, the necessary equipment. Regarding the question posed by uh, Mr. González Casares, uh, this is very much related to this. If we open or if we reserve a fraction of these uh, regulatory back auctions to the industry, this is the best way to give them all the buying power to reduce the problem that, w that they have because of not enough counterparty uh, risk, to make sure that the contracts that are being auctioned off satisfy their hedging needs currently under PPAs, uh, buyers, industrial consumers, they do not get a full hedge of their needs. Why? Because typically the producers, they sell pay as produce contracts that essentially hedge them for a, a profile that is similar to the production profile, which need not be the same as their consumption profile. So if the regulator is the system acts on behalf of, of the industrial players, this is the best way for them to have access to a stable and competitive prices. If we rely on PPAs and CFDs, this doesn't mean that we are not relying on competitive forces. This doesn't mean that we are breaking the internal market. All we are doing is shifting competition, or rather complementing short-run competition with competition for long-run contracts. And these setups tend to be more competitive. Why? Because we are allowing entry of new players into the market that might have access to better financial conditions if they win one of these uh, long-term uh, auctions. So we are relying on competitive mechanisms. And not only that, but we are also contributing to making uh, these markets uh, more, more competitive. Um, I think these, these were the questions that were addressed. Yes, just let me, if so I may, much. just a, a, a one point. When we are dealing with CFDs and PPAs, this is for the new investments. But let's not forget that there's many existing assets, and we have to do something about this, because if we keep on paying the existing assets, and there are many of those at the current short-run electricity prices, we run the risks that gas prices go uh, uh, go up again, and we run the risk that uh, for the existing assets, we keep on paying extremely high prices that they do not deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Zakman, please. 
Yes, um, many thanks for uh, for those. Uh, yeah, great question. Was uh, was really helpful also for us to to see a bit what to, to focus on. Um, let me let me start with um, the question for uh, for the uh, um, for the short term and whether we are running into a problem of uncertainty in the short term. So what we have been proposing also in the, in the paper, I, I brought a few copies, is a sort of a, a booster for renewables in an intermediate period. So the reason why we are proposing that is we think there is a significant uncertainty over market design uh, questions that risk to delay people going to invest now because they are worried about what cash flows they are going to get. There is a short-term supply problem in Europe still this year and next year. So every kilowatt that we install this year is worth twice as much or so than a kilowatt that we install in, uh, in three, four years. So do, kind of pulling things forward helps a lot in, uh, in bringing prices down in the, in the near term. We are sitting still on a lot of unconnected renewables, so we can actually some some more can be connected, and the pipelines in some uh, fields like uh, onshore wind are drying out uh, relatively quickly. So we need to make sure that we uh, that we uh, that we get those pipelines filled, and we agreed with the Repower EU to get a higher target. So uh, this higher target somehow needs to be delivered on. Um, so what we uh, what we think can be done is to, to have a sort of first come first serve uh, instrument on a European level that encourages um, renewables investors to get connected as quickly as they possibly can, potentially sharing the money with, uh, with network operators to make sure that the, that the connection happens and there's a fixed amount of money given for that and through this first come first serve there's also competition between the member states trying to connect as much as possible, as quickly as possible, so that we really get a, uh, get the, uh, get a boost in order to get over the energy crisis, because the energy crisis is not over. I mean, we still have the, uh, uh, the, the challenge in terms of supply security. We do not share the view, the view that, uh, that we, are, uh, we are through yet. Um, the um, second uh, question I would like to, to reply to is on, the, uh, on, this, uh, on this European agency. We will actually have an article this week in Nature, where we call together also with some of the colleagues here, uh, for a sort of a European energy agency. The idea there is to say we want to get predictability in Europe, we want to better uh, 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 have better, clearer planning of uh, how, where our energy system is going. We want to have a benchmark to which policymaker can understand whether certain market design choices, whether certain network development choices make sense. And it does not make sense to leave this to, uh, to companies only. That needs to be a public institution mm -hmm. that has the, uh, has the charge to provide such a, such a benchmark outlook on, uh, on where we are going. In the end, we still have a market that delivers on that, that makes sure that, uh, that, we, uh, that we get it efficiently, uh, but we need some more planning because things like contracts for difference, we will decide on volumes of contracts for difference, and we will somehow design in these contracts for difference technology preferences, so we need some public tool to be able to assess whether these are the right preferences that we are, uh, that we are giving them. Um, um, that links also a bit to the, to the question of uh, Michael Bloss on the trans-European networks. Here again, we need some top-down element on, on trans-European network planning. It does not make sense to only make it bottom-up uh, because we have got too little of trans-European networks. If we look into the, uh, into the scenarios from, uh, uh, from modeling exercises, we see we need much more cross-border uh, um, exchange capacity. A final point on, uh, on contract for difference design. Um, what, in my view, is important is that contract for difference are designed in a way that encourage system-friendly uh, um, um, investment. So we do not only care about kilowatt hours uh, and the, a massive amount of kilowatt hours, but we care about when those kilowatt hours are being pro, uh, produced and where. And there are ideas for making that happen with, uh, with benchmarking systems, but I think that is, goes too far to, to, uh, to explain that in, uh, in detail now. Um, a second element is uh, we need to coordinate the volumes uh, that member states are uh, handing out in those, um, 
in this contract for difference or uh, things. Thank you. And then uh, a half point, sorry for, for that, on, uh, on REMET, because I, I did my PhD on uh, exercise of market power. And what I experienced uh, 20 years back was that there is, no, uh, there is no data available for researchers to look into that, to learn how to monitor market power exercise. We are pretty sure that in the last year, supply and demand situation was so tight that it must have been possible to exercise market power, but we, have no, not, we don't have developed the tools to be able to do so. So make anonymized data available for research for people to better understand uh, how we can help ASAR and, and other institutions doing their job, because they, with their small uh, headcount, will not be able to, uh, to do this methodological work, but we need the data. Thank you so much. Mr. Vasconcelos, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I understand that uh, my plaidoyer for decentralization faces some uh, perplexity because it's new, it's difficult, it's complex. Um, we don't have time. Uh, we could frighten investors and so on and so forth. I fully understand those uh, arguments, but please follow me in my reasoning. If we look back to the last 20 years, and we look at the statistics of the three largest uh, member states in terms of population, we, um, we, under, we realize that there was no substantial investment on transmission capacity, zero. In some cases, it was even negative, as I showed in a report published last year with statistical data. Why should I believe that the next 15 years will be better? Are we sure that uh, we will be able to, to build, to double the capacity, transmission capacity in Europe. And then let's have a look at demand. Where is demand? Demand is mainly local today, right? Buildings, mobility. Look at 2030, decarbonization through electrification. This means that we are going to double or more electricity demand. Where? In cities. So why are we discussing centralized models centralized markets, centralized targets for renewables, storage, this and that, when the, the action is local. So what we need is an appropriate framework, institutional and operational and market platforms at the local level, because the needs of Athens are not the needs of uh, Copenhagen. The needs of Brussels are not the needs of Madrid. We must accept this diversity Otherwise, we are trying to impose a single price with multiple subsidies, and I believe it would be better to have the, the other thing, multiple prices and no subsidies. Now, it takes some time, it takes some courage, yes, but uh, uh, things are complex. Uh, on the two concrete questions about ACER and uh, state ownership, uh, but maybe just a last point. If, if we look at the investments in the past uh, decades, uh, more than 60% of electricity generation was connected at the distribution level, uh, medium and high voltage level, not uh, at the transmission level. So this, this happened uh, in the past, and this is what is happening nowadays. And nowadays what we see is a huge deployment of storage, electrical and thermal storage, because all the electric vehicles and heat pumps are nothing else than huge storage capacities being installed locally in a decentralized way. But they are not taken into account in our plans for 2030, because we, are, we only think in a centralized way. About ACER, uh, <clears throat> I think that ACER needs more than just uh, more money. ACER needs the institutional recognition as an European regulator. We cannot have a well-functioning internal electricity market without a European regulator. I'm very sorry, but it's just a, a matter of fact. Uh, logically, it does not work, and historically, it does not work. Look at the United States. We can learn from the, the, the existence of state and federal regulators. Uh, we are not going to invent something else. So we need to reinforce not only uh, the staff, but also the competencies of uh, the European energy regulator. On state ownership, very quickly, I don't think, frankly, that uh, replacing the existing structure 
replacing in the existing structure private companies with public companies will deliver the results we expect in terms of affordability and uh, decarbonization by 2030, because what we need is a new institutional setup. What we need is to think about a new role for the public authorities, in particular for municipalities, in, in articulation with the national authorities and the European uh, level. So if we don't change our mindset, if we don't look at this issue of the whole of the public authorities in shaping the transition, and we think that just by having public money uh, given to those companies, we, we solve the problems. Frankly, I don't think that this is the way. Uh, I see a, an increasing role for public authorities, but it's mainly on shaping and managing this very important issue of energy system integration, because only them can do the necessary public debates and then reach the necessary trade-offs because there are lots of trade-offs and this, these are the citizens in each city that have to, to meet. They have to decide how they want to move in terms of uh, decarbonizing uh, heating or whether they want to have a district heating network or uh, a, a huge massive deployment of heat pumps or something else. Thank you. So that's the way I believe that we, we should work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lofredo, please. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for the questions. Um, so answering to uh, Mrs. De Grasse Carvalho's question on how we can uh, make sure that consumers can access the benefits of renewable uh, electricity. I'm afraid I'm going to say the word implementation twice and I hope it's not too boring. Um, on the generation side, uh, what is lacking is implementation of uh, renewable energy electricity. Uh, consumers who feed electricity into the grid still receive too little remuneration rates. We have a study by our Dutch member, Consument and Bond, that shows that uh, half of the suppliers in, in the Netherlands uh, give back to consumers only 70% of, uh, of the wholesale price, while uh, two suppliers out of 30 give consumers back 7% of the wholesale price, which is uh, too little and it's not in line with what is written in the Renewable Energy Directive. So these, uh, uh, well, first of all, there should be a focus on implementation. Secondly, uh, this uh, idea, this promotion of energy sharing is positive because it, it gives consumers uh, who generate their own electricity a different avenue to, uh, to sell their, uh, the electricity they produce. On the consumer side, so on the consumer who consumes electricity, again, there is a lack of implementation of the clean energy package. Uh, consumers, in principle, should be allowed or should be entitled to sign up for a dynamic price contract if they can sign up for a dynamic price contract when there is a lot of renewable electricity available in the system, and if they can shift their consumption to those times, then consumers can make savings because electricity will be very cheap. Um, on top of uh, implementation, though, this new proposal uh, does something that is positive, which is uh, uh, granting consumers access to a dedicated metering device. Some consumers might be willing to, um, to sign up for a contract exposing them to wholesale prices only for those uh, consumption uh, patterns or those products that uh, can be used more flexibly, like a heat pump or an electric vehicle. So what the Commission is proposing, meaning granting consumer access to a, a submitter or a dedicated metering device, is very positive. However, uh, again, David is in the detail. Uh, what uh, would be needed is a requirement on, for national regulatory authorities to calculate what the cost of this metering device and of this uh, uh, rollout of a dedicated metering device is, so that then can uh, set some tariffs that reflect these costs. This is important to avoid that consumers overpay to have a dedicated metering device. Uh, moving to uh, the second question, uh, I mean the question by Gonzalez Casares and by uh, Michael Bloss. Um, how can we better protect uh, vulnerable consumers on top of what's in the proposal? I'd say three things. Uh, the first one, uh, energy sharing. Uh, an idea could be to uh, target uh, some, a certain percentage of the electricity produced by the solar panels owned by public authorities like municipalities uh, to vulnerable consumers. So to make sure that a, share, a certain share of this electricity that is going to be affordable gets to vulnerable consumers. This would be a concrete way to reduce their energy bills. Uh, second point uh, is about CFDs, making sure that the revenues from, uh, from CFDs are targeted to vulnerable consumers. Rather than giving uh, you know, the revenues to everyone, that uh, would be a drop in the ocean for everyone and would not benefit uh, anyone really because uh, you know, those who need the money uh, will not receive enough money and those who don't need the money 
you know, will be able to pay a dinner out, which is nice, but I guess it defeats the purpose. Uh, it would be important to target these revenues to vulnerable consumers, preferably by giving them access to uh, renewable energy, so allowing them to, inst to install solar panels or to shift uh, to energy efficiency. Uh, the last point uh, is about uh, uh, helping those consumers who don't have a smart meter to monitor their, uh, their electricity consumption. A uh, smart meter rollout is only 50%. There is a risk that during the winter, uh, since uh, uh, consumers only receive information on their energy consumption based on, uh, the, uh, on, the yearly, uh, on, their, on what is expected that they will consume over the year. So there is a risk that consumers during winter and during summer in uh, southern countries might uh, lose uh, uh, track of how much electricity they are, that they are using, and this might lead to very high settlement bills when, uh, the, uh, when the, the meter is actually read and consumers receive uh, a bill based on the actual consumption. Thank you. A concrete way would be uh, to require energy suppliers to regularly inform consumers and regularly invite consumers to self-read their meter and send the self-reading of their meters so that they can better uh, track their uh, electricity consumption and we avoid the risk of, uh, uh, of settlement bills of uh, thousands of euros. Uh, thank, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Mr. Ruby, please. Thank you. Um, starting with the topic of capacity mechanisms, um, this is a topic that, that also generates uh, a lot of uh, intensive discussion in, in, uh, in the industry itself. Um, it really depends on, on what regions uh, people come from, whether, whether they, they, like, they like these or not. Um, as your electric, we see a structural underinvestment in the, um, in the firm capacity that's needed by the market and uh, in storage and DS are as well, even if they're picking up, they're far away from what we would need uh, in terms of delivering on the energy transition. So how would they be uh, designed with a view to deliver here? Um, what was agreed in the clean energy package was that um, these would be uh, measures of last resort and that they would, um, that there was a preference for uh, for a certain type of, of mechanisms. We believe that this should be an integral part of the market uh, for those who choose to go that avenue. It all, may also be that parts of Europe would, would not opt for this, but it needs to be an option to, to basically systematically integrate it and for those assets that are part of a mechanism also to participate in the market. If these are set up as markets, as capacity markets, this does not have to, to basically um, be a public subsidy. And, um, and then, of course, it's important that they're inclusive so that they support investments in uh, the DSR, in storage, uh, in uh, the wide variety of, of, uh, of different types of assets that are needed uh, for the transition. <clears throat> Uh, and that, I should also underline, also includes uh, flexible power plants. These will be needed for a long time to come uh, if we want uh, the reliable electricity sector that we can base uh, a big part of uh, society's energy needs on. Um, to the second question of uh, do we have a gap to fill, I think it's fair to say yes. Um, uh, investments in the energy transition are off track. Um, if the deployment pace continues uh, at the current pace, the 2030 targets will take more than 20 years to deliver. Um, and uh, that means we need to think about how to speed up. That's about investor certainty. Um, and the question of implementation here, I think we should really think of in the context of the governance regulation, which will be uh, reviewed uh, once we, we come to the next commission. Um, we, we do face a situation where, you know, it's tempting to introduce more things, more measures, uh, emergency measures to do this and that. The risk is that we add confusion rather than, than a clear uh, way forward. And last but not least to the, to the remit. Now, it's, it's very uh, uh, difficult to be against uh, uh, transparency. Of course, we're in favor of a proper transparent market and we are in favor of basically being able to, to find and prosecute people that, that manipulate with it. The question is, how do we get about this to a process and a proposal and a legislation that delivers on this? Um, again, this is a proposal without a proper impact assessment. Uh, are we comfortable to go forward in a way where we do not know exactly what the impacts of what we're doing uh, will be? Um, we raised that question. The existing framework has worked fairly well. Um, 
always room for improvement, but we believe that the right way to do this is to take the proper time, analyze things, and, and go forward in a, in a structurally um, uh, responsible and informed manner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We go to the second round. Uh, we have 12 colleagues, and uh, if you can uh, please uh, uh, ask the question in one minute or make the comment, it will be very helpful because uh, then we have a second, a third round, of, actually, of uh, answers and interventions from our guests. I start with Mrs. Nibler, EPP. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to, to attend the hearing. Thanks for the interesting contributions. Uh, I have to admit that I do not, I'm not sure as to whether I have a clear picture um, on as to whether the objectives which we want to achieve with this reform are really going to be met. So uh, I would like to ask our, uh, the experts two questions. So really, are you sure that uh, with the proposals and all the instruments uh, now proposed, we get more co competitive energy prices for consumers and industry? A lot has been said on the PPA, on the CFD, but could you just elaborate on the virtual hubs once again and the peak shaving uh, instruments as well? And secondly, you know, uh, you mentioned that the investments in renewable and grid infrastructure is key. I agree. Trust is needed for that. So again, uh, just to give me a more reassurance of where to look at in more closer detail. So do you think what's on the table is, is the right approach or it's not the right approach? I learned that capacity ma markets, uh, as the first speaker said, are key as well in order to build them up. I agree on that. And I also agree on the, on, the, on the fact that the energy crisis is not yet over, so we have to have a careful look at it. But again, are the instruments, or what are the instruments where you think we really should reshape once again? And last question, maybe also, you know, uh, on the regional energy cooperation, on the issue of subsidiarity versus market integration. I'm also not, I have not a good feeling. So what, what, what is the message I have to take, I have to take out from what you've said? So... I learned we need more regional cooperation, but how does that fit, you know, with the idea of, 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 of this market integration? I would be happy to learn about that. And as regards the European Energy Agency, which had also been stressed, I do agree that, you know, we have to work on, you know, to reshape and to, to talk about the competences this energy, uh, uh, um, uh, European Energy Agency has to be vested in. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you Mrs. Nibler. Mr. Nika, please. Thank you so much, Chair. So, dear colleagues, January last year, in this very room, I said in the name of our political group, SND group, that the current market design, it, it is a clear example of a market failure. And I, we gave examples. The citizens are happy. The, the, the level of the bills at the level unbelievable, uh, hard to be, to be believed uh, the, uh, the year before. The same for the industry. At least those of the, them which uh, they uh, not already went uh, bankrupt. In the meantime, we said that because the lack of transparency and because the market manipulation and because uh, the, uh, the unfair trade uh, practices, there are entities who made hundreds of billions of euros, tens or hundreds of billions of euros. And we said that is totally unacceptable. And we said that we have to have a new energy market design and we have to be sure that everything will be transparent. That was the key words we used at the time. I noticed that from some of our speakers, it is like, okay, we'll, we'll, uh, let's have a kind of reform, but not a real one. Maybe a kind of business as usual, because uh, the current model, uh, we have to have, make uh, small adjustments, but this will be totally unacceptable, and it will be a, a huge blow, and it will be a huge failure from the European Parliament if we don't manage to shake the system, because the, the current model, it is not a model designed to protect neither the consumers, private or industrial consumers, uh, and nor to preserve our most important values, which is transparency. Most probably, we have to, 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 to think about that as if ACER is the right entity to take care of the energy market. Most probably is ESMA, because ACER, one, it was in April, I think, one year ago. They said, that's perfect. We have a nice model. This model is perfectly functional. Thank you. But this is totally unacceptable. And on the remit, we have to take serious measures. 
with for profits uh, doesn't mean that we have to uh, put taxation. They have to pay uh, taxes on their uh, the turnovers because somebody paid the windfall uh, the, prof, uh, the, the prices and this led to the inflation. 80% of the inflation is due to the energy prices. Thank, Thank you so, so much, Mr. Nika. Mr. s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to also thank the speakers today. I give them time to put their headphones on, but I'm going to take just one minute of your time, no more, just to say that I think that this view of the electricity market is really key. It's key for the consumers to be able to really reap the benefits of our electricity system. I, th I see three key uh, uh, benefits, energetic, economic and uh, climate benefits. Now, it's an, there's an energy benefit because thanks to this market structure, there's going to be a guarantee of supply. Economic, because we're going to try and get them at reasonable prices. And also climate benefits because it's going to be decarbonized. So just to, to sum it up, I think that this uh, review should ensure that the uh, amounts that are actually reaped through the long-term contracts, such as the ECFDs, actually finds its way to the households and also to industry to lighten their burden their, their, and their bills. So I'd like to know whether you agree with this. How can we ensure that the revenue, that the, the excess revenue is actually fairly redistributed? Uh, we, so, can it actually help both the producers and also the, the consumers? Thank you. This is Del Castillo Vera, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I go for my one minute. I had initially two questions, but uh, the first one was largely answered by most of the panelists. So, I go with for my second. I must say previously that uh, uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, your presentation was really clear and eloquent as well. It's an important aspect of the story. Uh, well, the Commission proposal promotes uh, power uh, purchase agreements but exclude energy intensive industries from the electricity prices uh, crisis mechanism. Uh, being these companies, the commodities, they find great difficulties uh, in transferring uh, the energy costs uh, to the sale price especially if the price are set internationally. Uh, shouldn't this industry, in addition to SMEs and households, be included in the emergency mechanism? My question, since we have to save time, uh, goes for George uh, Sackman from Bregel. I have to pick up one. Thank you so much, Pilar. Uh, Mr. Bloss, one minute. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, just some, some two more questions. So the first one is um, to Professor Fabra. If I get you correct, then your main concern with the PPAs is um, the amount of, of state aid involved. Um, and, and you prefer CFDs, but isn't the main question that, like, the, the, the question is which instrument to take um, to reduce the amount of state aid and, and what are the best mechanisms for this? Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this. And um, um, to pro Professor um, Raskon Celos, um, now we have the well, the commission. Uh, well, the commission proposes to use CFDs, but leaves a lot of room for member states, um, and they can also, I mean, they, they can make technology-specific um, CFDs, so they can make a specific CFDs for nuclear. How do you see the impact of this kind of specific um, support for nuclear in terms of business case for renewables and renewable, um, yeah, well, the deployment of renewables? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Geyer, please. Mr. Geyer, Jens. Thank you, Herr Präsident. Ich würde gerne. Thank you, Chair. I will speak German. My question is about a possible tariff for uh, industry for electricity. We have the problem that through the, uh, throughout the European Union, prices are higher here than in the, glo the global price for en en electricity. 
And I think that this is a uh, because we want to avoid any competition distortions. We've got to make sure that we're able to be competitive. Now, and someone's got to pay the difference in, in the market there. And I wonder whether you see any approaches in the Commission's plans to try and generate the uh, make up for these differences. Thank you so much, Mr. Gair. Mrs. Piraki, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. This uh, exchange has taken too long, but it is important to, to make a short, very short, very brief comment when it comes to, to, to the main issues that we have to tackle. And the first one is, how can we incentivize long-term contracts with non-fossil power, power production? And I think that we cannot exclude any kind of solution. We have to include PPAs, we have to include uh, contracts of difference, uh, two-wage contracts of difference, and also forward contracts, but it's part of discussion as well. The second is to, to bring more clean, flexible solutions into the system to compete with gas, meaning that we need first decentralization, and I fully agree with Mr. Vasconcelos approach, and also we need to increase the transmission capacity by investing heavily in this regard. And third is to streamline the EU energy market by integrating it and avoid unfair competition between member states in the energy sector. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Peterson has already opened this discussion. So, according to my opinion, I have two questions to, to, to pose on this discussion. The first one is uh, how this model will facilitate the upscale of innovative solution regarding, for instance, clean, uh, clean hydrogen, as on, not only as an as a energy car, but also as an energy storage facility. And second, how can we facilitate the cheaper renewables? And in this regard, how, how can we integrate the cheaper renewables into the system, in particular to, to the variable consumers? My third Thank question you. is concerning on the issue of transforming the mandate of asset and uh, creating a, a, a hub in terms of, uh, of collecting data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mr. Zorinho, please. Thank you, Chairman. Parliament is keen to contribute to an effective reform of the energy market. We don't just want cosmetic measures. Even before the pandemic and, and the war, we needed reform. It's even more urgent now. And we need to combine sustainability, predictability, and flexibility. Now, I'm grateful for the contributions, uh, in particular to George Vasconcelos. He set out a structure which would provide strong motivation with a cross of a, a multi level distributed market with guarantees for in integration, competitiveness, and sustainability of the, the system on a local basis. And that's why we need predictability. And we have to take the steps which will allow us to modernize the grids and the platforms, including digital platforms. Mr. Vascoselos made a few specific references to the PPAs, etc. But I think it's important to get some more detailed comment from him regarding how we would fund this with a political vision and trust. There has to be trust in the system. The point was made that he had this vision 15 years ago, he said. Ten years ago, the world looked rather different. So how are we actually going to finance this proposal? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Kitadar, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And I'm uh, very glad to see that the uh, proposed reform of the electricity market design takes an inclusive approach to nuclear uh, power, for instance, with uh, regards to the contracts for difference. What makes me a bit confused, however, is uh, how the European Commission won't seem to make up its mind, uh, really. On one hand, we have, for example, the position of nuclear technology in the Net Zero Industry Act, where nuclear power is not listed in the annex as a, a strategic net zero technology. On the other hand, uh, we have actions from the Commission that strive in the opposite direction, for instance, with the taxonomy and, as it seems, uh, the electricity, electricity market reform. And since we don't have the Commission here today, um, I instead want to ask, ask the question to the experts that are present. What is your opinion on how the reform of the EU's electricity market design can affect Europe's nuclear power? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Ponsati-Obiols. Thank you. 
I have a question for Professor Fabra and Mr. Zachman uh, regarding uh, marginal pricing and the new uh, long-term uh, mechanisms that this reform seems to be adding. Um, could you please elaborate a little bit more on, I mean, this to me think, looks like, you know, tinkering with the uh, marginal pricing uh, approach to market design, which uh, for us who believe in uh, um, economic theory, I know that not everybody shares that, but uh, it would have been surprising somebody asked the committee to ignore I don't know, uh, theoretical physics or mathematics, but we have heard something like that today. Uh, nevertheless, I would ask these experts to see if they can elaborate a little bit more about how they see the preservation of the basic uh, mechanisms of marginal pricing under these uh, uh, CFDs and long-term pricing. Thank you. Thank you, and we have uh, one catch the eye request. This is Vice. Thank you so much. Um, I have just uh, one question to uh, uh, Professor Sackman from Bruegel uh, concerning uh, coordination between member states. Um, I don't think anyone can disagree on that, but uh, could you elaborate a little bit more in e explaining us where does the proposals not reach uh, the, the potential uh, hereof? Uh, what are your recommendations when it comes to that? And also, where do you see some challenges also concerning uh, subsidiarity and, and the respect uh, of member state competences when we articulate over and over again and, and we applaud it because there is some kind of an, um, logic to that when it comes to market integration. Right now we are opening uh, uh, the, the directive uh, and hopefully also closing it again without uh, damaging uh, also subsidiarity issues when it comes to, to market integration, but also in a way where we really boost the coordination. So could you please elaborate a little bit more on that? That could be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. No more other interventions. Uh, we go back to our experts and uh, using the same order, it's the easiest way. I'll start with... Uh, Mr. Purhala, same 18 minutes scheduled. Uh, we are already a little bit uh, behind us, but we still have interpreters with us because the slot was longer. So please uh, answer to the questions, and if you have a final remark, final conclusion, it is the moment to use it. Each of the esteemed guests. Mr. Purhala, please. Thank you very much. So um, I think the most important question was whether the whether the consumers are happy about how competitive the market is and how competitive the energy supply is. And obviously, the, the, the last winter shows that, uh, that uh, not everything is perfect, that we are vulnerable to, to supply shocks, and uh, we need to do our best in order to increase our resilience to such supply shocks. What it, what it is for me quite important from last year, from last winter, is that we, we kind of lost one source of energy supply and the other energy supply sources were not able to ramp up. And I think we need to make sure that we have the ability in the future to have energy sources which are indeed able to ramp up and produce electricity when it is necessary. For me, this comes down again to the question of megawatts versus megawatt hours, meaning generation capacity versus the produced energy. We need to have in Europe resources which are able to generate electricity when the consumers need it, and we need to have diverse technologies so that any supply shocks uh, will not cause uh, too much of, um, of a problem and too much of a price increase. Um, when it comes to uh, the tools to achieve that, so as I, as I uh, try to explain in my intervention, I think the capacity remuneration mechanisms as proposed by the, by the electricity regulation is the right way forward, but it shall be a standard part of market design and there is no need for this state aid and analysis and all this, all this uh, burden. If we do a market-based capacity market, in 
places where we have excess of capacity, the value will be zero or be very low. So there's gonna be no extra cost for consumers. In areas where you need to have significant buildup of new capacity because the system demands it and the consumers demand it, then obviously the value of the capacity will be higher. I also um, uh, shared my opinion that uh, the technology limitations in the capacity markets, the ones which are embedded in the new proposal and in the old proposal, there are having consequences and these consequences are also for the consumers because if there is not enough capacity to be provided from sources which meet the restrictions, the price of the capacity goes up. And uh, even in, the, in, in some situations, the, 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 uh, the, the, it's not possible to buy the, the, the necessary amount of capacity to provide the consumers the, the, the guarantee of security of supply which they need, because simply there is no supply of such capacity. And in the last uh, sentence from myself is that today, we are building towards a green future with, uh, uh, without, without emissions. And we will look for new technologies which allow us to make the best use of renewables. And everyone is working very hard to do so. However, um, until we have these technologies, we still need to use what we have so that we are able to still power the modern economy of Europe. And we have the ability to do, to do R&D, to have these new technologies, new storage technologies, roll them out massively in Europe and also build new dispatchable clean technologies which don't exist, don't, don't exist yet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mrs. Fabra, please. Hello. I fully agree with Mr. Nika when he says that European citizens are going to be disappointed if we don't manage to provide a satisfactory electricity market design that addresses the large wealth transfers from consumers to firms that we are consenting if we do not change electricity market design uh, in meaningful ways. Why are they going to be disappointed? Because indeed, and answering to Mrs. Nibler, uh, electricity prices are not competitive and they're not going to be competitive under the current uh, proposal essentially because there is no new elements uh, on the table. No, the energy crisis is not over and not only it is not over, but we are exposed to the exact same fears as we've been exposed to uh, over the, the last uh, two years. Uh, the European Commission uh, proposal contains some um, 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 ingredients that are welcome and among them, and I'm now addressing Mr. Woodler question, is the ability to uh, directly return the revenues of the contract for differences to, com to customers directly. This is something that was not allowed before and now it has been completely understood that when regulators auction off these contracts, they, they are just uh, acting as market makers and therefore, it is consumers who eventually, ultimately, are the uh, um, um, party that is going to benefit from these lower prices that are achieved through auctions. So, responded to Mr. Bloss, no, there's no uh, public money involved in contract for differences. Uh, just the regulator is committing uh, some electricity prices for the future that are going to provide the source of competitive and stable prices uh, for the end users. Uh, instead, on the contrary, if we want to promote PPAs, we have to put uh, public money on the table because we have to guarantee uh, these contracts, which, by the way, are, are highly risky. Why? Because the buyers will have a strong incentives to walk out of these contracts because in the future, thanks to the deployment of renewables, uh, electricity market prices in short-run markets are going to go down, which is going to give them a strong incentive to walk out of these contracts. Clean hydrogen, well, really the best uh, uh, solution for promoting clean hydrogen is to make sure that the hydrogen producers have access uh, to electricity at competitive prices, which, as you know, is one of the main inputs for hydrogen production. So if we are serious about promoting renewable gases, we have to be serious about achieving competitive electricity uh, prices. Theory regarding marginal pricing, while well, I'm also a theorist, and what we know from theory is that these markets guarantee or promote 
productive efficiency, yet uh, the competitive electricity market model is based on an assumption that doesn't apply in practice, which is the lack of free entry. Because there is no free entry, these excessive profits that generators are making are not competing away. Nuclear power generators, hydropower generators, they are receiving prices that have exceeded 200 euro per megawatt hour when their costs are one tenth of that. These profits are not competed away because of the lack of free entry, and therefore the competitive market model uh, doesn't uh, apply to electricity markets. Just to conclude, I think the stakes are high. I think that uh, the European citizens are expecting that we solve this problem, that we do not consent anymore that uh, power companies make large profits while they are suffering from energy poverty, uh, while they are losing their jobs because the European industry is going elsewhere, uh, while they are paying higher mortgage fees because uh, interest rates have gone up as a consequence of rising inflation. I think the, uh, the stakes are high and I, I really uh, welcome the initiative of the European Parliament of having this public hearing to hear our views on this uh, important topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will invite Mr. Zakmano. Yes. So, I mean, as I said, the crisis is not yet over. We have too little energy in, uh, in Europe for the foreseeable future. If you look into the futures prices, and that has nothing to, to do with the distribution uh, within the system, but with a lack of volumes. So the cake is too small and too many people want to, uh, to eat the cake. Now, the question is, how do we allocate a too small cake if not uh, with, with the signal of prices? And it is unfortunate news, but uh, if we want to give uh, a larger share of this cake to industry, that does not only mean that the prices for everybody else are increasing, but also that they need to get a smaller share of this cake unless we invest massively. So, in principle, the Commission approach to say we put our focus on investment is the right one because it's the only way that gets us out of the crisis without us having to reduce massively our consumption. So that's the, the only structural way, and this structural problem is staying for, for a couple of more years. Therefore, quick investments are the, are the, uh, uh, are the kind of yeah, structural solution. Now, on the... Um, uh, on the cross-border uh, and whether this is the, the big reform. Now, I don't think that this now here, what we are discussing, is the, is the big reform that brings us to net zero emission uh, ready electricity system. There are so many things that need to change for a net zero emission electricity system with doubling electricity demand, much higher share of volatile uh, renewables, um, more decentralization and so on, which are not properly addressed in this reform, but with, which need to be quickly addressed properly. So we need now to prepare the ground, hopefully maybe in this legislation or uh, on the sides of it, for a process, for a discussion that allows us in the legislati next legislative uh, mandate to come up with the big reform that really sets us up for providing credible investment signals in, uh, in the, uh, the full-scale decarbonization and electrification of, uh, of our society. I actually like uh, Jorge Vasconcelos' uh, uh, idea on, the, on local experimentation. I think maybe there is a way to opening up individual pieces for, for that as a, as a starting point to, uh, to test out what can work because, I mean, we, we don't have enough examples, so maybe allowing some regions to experiment is, a, uh, is, an, uh, is an interesting, like, you know, competitive way to, uh, to test those, uh, those elements. Um, and then on, uh, on coordination between uh, member states, I think one of, the, uh, yeah, one of the challenges is if one country devises a support mechanism for a certain technology massively, then this technology will be very cheaply available or the product that this technology produces in all the other countries, may, uh, reducing the investment case for this technology in the other countries. If one country deploys 100 gigawatt of batteries like Germany plans to do in, in one of its plans, it might be more difficult to justify such investments in, uh, in, in other countries. So there are significant spillovers and we need to make sure that not one country can essentially flood the market with, with certain types of, uh, of products. This needs to be coordinated. The NECPs might be one way to have this discussion. This energy agency that we are proposing uh, can be one thing. Opening up in the, uh, in, the, in the legislation, making sure that it needs to be consulted with neighbors might be, might be a way. But we need to find ways to make sure that not one country can essentially determine the fuel mix of other implicitly. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Vasconcelos, please. Thank you very much. Just to avoid any doubts about uh, uh, my way of thinking, I am a, a, an European Federalist. I advocated here the creation of an independent European system operator. I advocated here uh, the creation of uh, an European energy regulator. But the rational application of the principle of subsidiarity today leads me to the conclusion that the action is mainly at the local level today, and that's where we should put our focus. Of course, we, we want to keep our internal market, but the internal market can exist in many different ways. We are not going to radically change what we have. The Commission's proposal is a pragmatic approach, is releasing some, uh, relaxing some of the restrictions that we have today and allow for other ways of managing our system. What I say and what I advocate is that we accelerate, that we open more doors, that we create more opportunities for innovation technical innovation, on storage, which has been mentioned many times, on participation of demand, on many other things that are possible only through digitalization. So um, when it comes to the issue of um, <clears throat> many of these tools that we are discussing here, I must confess that sometimes I feel puzzled because I, I hear remarks about some, some tools as if they were revolutionary, new. Uh, I'm very sorry, but this idea of having bilateral guaranteed state prices, I implemented them in 1997 when I was a regulator, without auctions. We had a guaranteed tariff, a feed-in tariff, and what the regulator said was, okay, if the market price is below the feed-in tariff, you get the difference paid by consumers. If the market price will be above your guaranteed tariff, you don't get the money, the consumers get the money. And that's exactly what's happening now and what happened last year in Portugal. That's why the Portuguese consumers don't pay more than 80 euros per megawatt hour, hour because that's the average price of the stock of guaranteed, state guaranteed prices that we have. By the way, in Portugal, about 60% of the generation has a state guaranteed price. And in many other countries, the figure is also above 50%, but it's not fashionable to talk about that, I'm very sorry. So some of the mechanisms are really not new. It just requires some uh, strict uh, application of some sound principles of uh, equity. Now, um, investments. I don't see the, the, the issue being an investor myself on generation, frankly speaking, or on storage. I am working on, on, on projects for storage and for uh, renewable generation. The problem is on the networks. We don't have enough network capacity, and that's the bottleneck. So where, where we need primarily new investments is on distribution networks and transmission networks subsidiarily, but mainly on distribution networks. And decisions on massive investments on distribution networks are political decisions. We, we must uh, accept the fact that we cannot depoliticize energy at this level, because these choices at the local level about how to decarbonize heating or how to decarbonize the mobility are political choices. And I see no reason why someone should impose the same choice in Athens or in Copenhagen or in Frankfurt or in Brussels. I'm sorry, but I'm a, a, an Europeanist. I don't want to impose the same choices. People have the right to, to, to take different approaches. And this leads to different kinds of investments at the distribution level. So we need different kinds of regulation for distribution networks. But what we need desperately is investment on networks, on the hardware and also on the software, on the digitalization of these networks. Because if the, the networks, if the infrastructure is not there, the other investments are useless. What all we do is to accumulate curtailment. And if consumers are paying to the, to the generators which are being curtailed, this is madness, I'm sorry. Thank you so, so much. The, the priority should be investments on the infrastructure. Don't worry too much about investments on generation because there is enough uh, uh, will and money to invest on that. What we need is a clear uh, picture that we are now here to support actively support innovative solutions, technically speaking, and also in terms of involvement of the citizens and business model. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lofredo, please. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. 
Um, there was a question on, uh, well, how do we allow uh, consumers to benefit from, from renewables? And, uh, you know, although I already answered to this question focusing on uh, uh, delivering the products and making sure that consumers have access to products uh, allowing them to, uh, to benefit from renewables, uh, such as dynamic electricity price contracts, uh, there is also a part that is linked to information to consumers and making sure that consumers receive information on these innovative products that they can understand in a way that they can understand what are the potential benefits. Uh, there is a requirement in the existing Article 11 uh, where suppliers should provide uh, consumers information about the potential benefits that they can achieve uh, with dynamic electricity price contracts, which, uh, again, was not implemented anywhere, so uh, implementation would be good. Uh, but at the same time, the Commission in the new proposal is uh, uh, suggesting to, uh, to further improve these information requirements so that, uh, you know, potentially many consumers will be uh, nudged to sign up for dynamic price contracts uh, and uh, uh, that will allow them to, uh, to save money if they're able to shift their consumption. But information, uh, it's not only before the contract, and it's, not so, uh, it's not only important pre-contraction information, it's, only, it's also important information that consumers receive uh, during, uh, in, when they signed up for that contract and during the usage. Uh, there is an interesting example, and uh, actually the most uh, downloaded smartphone, smartphone app today in Estonia, where... Uh, well, most consumers are on dynamic price tariffs and, uh, uh, and it's more downloaded than uh, Facebook and, uh, you know, all those uh, apps uh, uh, which are developed by big tech is an app that allows consumers to track hourly prices so that they can manage their consumption. Mm -hmm. These innovations are important to uh, facilitate consumer engagement in flexibility, allowing them to, uh, to make savings. Mm -hmm. And I want to close uh, just uh, uh, well, repeating my three uh, key messages in my opening uh, remarks. It's in, this review is important. This review is important for, for three reasons. Firstly, it's, uh, it's about uh, uh, better protecting vulnerable consumers and allowing uh, vulnerable consumers not to fear uh, these connections anymore and allowing them to access to, uh, to support from suppliers and from governments. Second point is about restoring consumer trust. Consumers who are signing up for a fixed price contract paying more for having a guarantee that the, con that the uh, price that they will pay until the end of the contract remain the same, those consumers should have a guarantee that this price will be fixed and this will not change unilaterally by, consumer, uh, by suppliers. The last point is about uh, uh, promoting energy sharing in a way that uh, uh, consumers can, uh, can, uh, can trust, that they can, that they can engage, and it's a safe environment by making sure that consumers who engage in energy sharing uh, enjoy appropriate consumer rights and protections. And thanks a lot uh, again for the invitation. Thank you so much. Mr. Ruby, please. Thank you. Um, one word about investors. Um, let's remember the, the challenge of the energy transition is a gigantic investor challenge. Investors are looking for return on investment. They're looking for something they understand. And right now in the US, they have the RA, which is very easy to understand. It's very easy to get a very strong business model out of the RA. Now, therefore, the word complexity is really, really critical when we look at what we have at the table here. Let's avoid that we introduce further complexity into the European legislation, which is already today extremely complex. 23 products for flexibility alone in the electricity market. It is a highly, highly complex thing to deal with energy in Europe. And therefore, uh, to the comments about the virtual trading hubs, um, we would really urge to say, if there's something we, we don't even understand as the sector, I don't know if, uh, if anybody in this, uh, in this esteemed house understands what's on the table. If nobody understands it, is it really something that's going to help uh, the investor challenge that we have? Same goes for the industrial tariffs, where whereas we can understand the idea that we need uh, competitively priced electricity, a specific tariff for industry the first question that comes to mind is, for what industry? Is it for all industries, from chewing gum to steel, or is it specific industries? And if, in that case, which industries? Um, for, for me, that would be a question of state aid still, and I would urge that we leave this out of this reform to avoid further complexity. Then we had the question about renewables. How do we then get the renewables going? Because we all understand that getting 
a lot of cheap renewables into the market is ultimately the key solution along with saving energy, by the way. Um, now, the central approach that's been uh, advocated by, by uh, some speakers, uh, Fabra, uh, Ms. Fabre, in, in this uh, discussion, let's remember that a central approach also entails a risk, and that's called the regulatory risk. We have examples of completely failed uh, public tenders because they were poorly designed. So by shifting from a decentral model to a centralized model, you introduce another risk. So a strong bet on a centralized approach is not a good idea. Also because, as we've heard from Vasconcelos, we are talking about, at least in part, a very decentral transformation of society. So. Do we really think that we can steer this all centrally? Let's be careful not to uh, become the, the sorcerer's apprentice and, and think we know what everybody else uh, has as their preference. Let's make sure that there is still a market for people to intervene to in, in, in to, to interact with each other, to buy electricity from each other and sell electricity to each other. Um, also on the tenders and, and, and on the cheap renewables, one of the things we have to acknowledge when making sound public policy is that prices have changed. It's no longer an option to uh, ask a lot of money um, for people to have a piece of seabed because that way uh, we're just not going to have the investments that we're looking for. We need to acknowledge that prices have increased and uh, when setting up tenders, which by the way are a fine idea in complement to the market, Let's make sure that these tenders are structured in a way that allow them to reflect price increases. That's going to be critical to get more investments into the market. Okay. And, um, and on top of that, I think we, we need to, to accept that um, unnecessary uh, centralization um, will really um, be necessary. If we go that way uh, with too much centralization, we are going to, to harm things more than we think. Uh, last but not least, how is this going to affect nuclear? Well, um, I think it's important for this reform to make sure that, that countries that have decided on nuclear uh, and that want to continue with nuclear uh, are allowed to do so. Crowding out one technology at this stage, which by the way is carbon free, would be detrimental to the energy transition. So countries that decide so um, should be allowed to, to continue uh, along that pathway. And um, what I've heard from the industry is that uh, the existing reform with the complement of long-term instruments such as PPAs would be sufficient for them uh, to, to, to basically make their necessary investments. Again, the forced approach, basically telling companies you're now forced to take on a new contract uh, that is politically determined, that's the recipe for disaster. That's the way not to, um, to induce more investments. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, last words, the two rapporteurs. I start with Mr. González Casares and then Mrs. Carvalho. Mr. González Casares. Gracias y gracias a la señora Carvalho por dejarme. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak first because I have to leave quickly. This has been a very interesting uh, debate. I think a lot of questions uh, have been answered. It's been uh, very helpful for the uh, debate, which we have limited time for. So thank you very much to all of the speakers. It's been very interesting. I just wanted to raise one point. I think there are a lot of points where we have overlaps here. Now, we understand the complexity here. The five or six speakers today have agreed on certain points and disagreed on others. I think political groups have a similar situation. So there are points where I agree with Maria or disagree with Morton and vice versa. I think this is very enriching as part of our debate that we are following and that we will continue to have. I would simply say please remain open-minded and bear two things in mind. We need better protection for the consumers. We are moving towards a more decarbonized system with more renewable energy. So having a better price for uh, renewables has to be reflected by what the consumers feel uh, as well. Otherwise, you're not going to have people buying into this energy transition. So that is important. And secondly, we need to move away from fossil fuels, but this cannot be done overnight. We have to accelerate our energy 
investment into renewable energies, we have to show that they can be profitable. Now, it might appear to be trying to square the circle here, but that's not what we're doing. It's a progressive path we're following here. We know that it is uh, possible this uh, reform won't be the last one over the last few years. That's important to bear in mind. And just finally, let me say, I think there are certain agreements, certain points in uh, common here between the different speakers, the different sectors, that we need to have better distribution, we need to have better investment. So I would call on all of these stakeholders and uh, speakers to see how we can do this, uh, how we can move forward. We need to, to actually go from ideas to legislative texts. Now, I know this is a very complex, but all uh, assistance is very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The last word, uh, Mrs. Carvalho. Thank you very much, Chair. I would like to thank all the speakers and all the colleagues that have intervened because it was a very interesting debate. Um, I agree with Nicholas that there are points that of agreement and points that uh, trigger more discussion. And I would, uh, I'm trying to summarize what I took from this discussion and points of agreement that we need a market design that leads to investment in a secure, low-cost, net-zero system, special investment in distribution network. Second, that ensures that the system costs are attributed to consumers in a fair way, that protects consumers, mainly the vulnerable and the energy poor consumers and rebuilds consumer trust, that open doors to promotes innovation and digitalization, and that promotes more market transparency, especially in the, using the remit. I would say that these are points that uh, we had a, an agreement, but, and the points that trigger more discussion is the degree of enthusiasm that uh, the different speakers uh, put in the support to the European Commission proposal. Uh, also a point that needs further discussion is the need to reopen the capacity mechanisms market and the appropriate instruments for long-term contracts and the design of these instruments. And in the end, the level of responsibility and articulation between local, regional, national and European. So points that we will, of course, discuss until the presentation of the reports and the amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Carvalho. I'd like to thank, first of all, of course, our uh, guests for uh, uh, their presentations, uh, their thoughts, uh, their suggestions, and also for answering to the questions. Uh, and to colleagues, uh, first of all, those who are very much involved as having responsibilities on those two files, the rapporteurs, the shadow rapporteurs, but also had uh, some of the coordinators and uh, some colleagues that uh, are extremely interested, uh, first of all, to work on the file, and second, of course, to be in contact, listen to the experts, listen to the voice of industry, civil society, uh, consumers, uh, professors, academia, in order to understand better what are the challenges and how we can improve the text. As I said uh, before, uh, at the beginning of the meeting, we go very fast. We try to accelerate as much as possible to finish this dossier by the end of the year, uh, clearly this mandate. Um, at least uh, the, our calendar is uh, very ambitious, but also very tight. So uh, amendments, colleagues, until 23rd of May, not so much time. And also if uh, the stakeholders, uh, the partners, have ideas for concrete amendments, besides, of course, the principles and the things that were shared today, please uh, send to us uh, before the deadline, and then, of course, there will be time to discuss amendments, to build compromises, uh, and then to vote. And I'm sure that also uh, the discussions with the Council during trilogues will be extremely interesting and uh, uh, challenging. Once again, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to ITRA Secretariat, to the interpreters, also for extra time, and to the services of the European Parliament. Colleagues, you tomorrow at 10 o'clock for the votes and coordinators at 9 o'clock for taking the necessary decisions. Thank you.